Hello, I'm Martha Norick. I am the city's chief analytics officer. I work for the Office of Data Analytics um, at the Office of Technology and Innovation, a rest, uh, like a nesting doll of offices. Um, we are the we are the the city office that runs um, New York City Open Data Program. So um, I, but I'm here today actually in my capacity as an Open Data Ambassador, which is a volunteer program. And I'll talk about it a little bit during the um, during the opening. Um, we train um, and certify folks to go out and teach a curriculum about New York City open data to your fellow New Yorkers. We do. We have programs at the libraries. We have programs um, with community boards. We have programs with uh, you. You to see if you'd like an open data ambassador to come to you, we will do it. So. Um, uh, yeah, if you, I, I will do my very, I'm, I am an open data ambassador. There are lots of other open data ambassadors. Some of them are city staffers, some of them are librarians, some of them are just civic tech enthusiasts. So you don't have to be a, you don't have to sort of, you know, be a, a native data person to be an open data ambassador. So, um, uh, I hope you all, uh, you know, come away from today thinking that maybe this would be a fun thing to do, but in the meantime, also just feeling confident about using open data. So actually this is good. I'm going to use my own laptop as the, as the, for the notes. And then, um, uh, we'll use, okay, great. And um, before we get started, though, I just want to maybe just get a little, um, get to know you guys a little bit. Um, who is, who do we have here? Uh, raise your hand if you, um, Let's see. Let's say. Let's raise your, raise your hand if you have used open data before. Or okay, great. Let raise your hand if you if you're like, what is open data? And I've never seen this one said before, and I'm not sure what I'm getting into. Excellent. Okay. Excuse uh, the process. Uh, Zoom running. I believe so. Yeah. Um. Although that I'm not really classically kind of standing right in front of the camera. Oh. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And the Zoom is running. Uh. Okay, and then when, well, like represent, representation wise, who's, who's here from, who's here from Brooklyn? All right. Queens. Manhattan. Staten Island. Oh, the Bronx. Yay! All right. <laughs> Excellent. So we have four of the five boroughs represented in this room, and we have a range of, range of knowledge about uh, open data. So um, at any point, um, city, City employees are notorious for acronyms. We love an acronym. If at any point I throw around some language that is like, where I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard that that, that like phrase before. Like just throw a hand up in the air. Let, let me know. Um, actually, do you think we can turn the lights on in here? Will we still be able to see the screen? Oh, there is that. Um, uh, yeah, at, at stop at any point, um, this hopefully will be as interactive as, as one can be with kind of a presentation format. Um, if you have a computer with you and you want to open it up and, and follow along, great. That's all, that's all good. Um, but we'll try to do is, uh, we'll, um, we'll, you know, work through some examples together as well. It's here. Okay. So we just did welcome and introductions. Um, and we have, um, we're going to do a quick overview of the history of open data. We actually got a little bit of that in the opening session. So I'm going to maybe use, like zip through that a little bit in the interest of time. Um, we're going to do a quick overview of the New York City open data platform. Um, we're going to talk about filtering open data. We're going to talk about visualizing open data. We're going to look at some examples of tools that use open data. So some of the tools that maybe have already done the work for you of some of the things that you're interested in doing with open data. But I think it's always good to know how to do it yourself as well. Um, and then we'll have, um, we'll have time for uh, hopefully a good amount of time for uh, Q&A um, and talk a little bit again about how to stay involved with Open Data and the Open Data Ambassadors Program uh, if you, that is of interest. So as Noel said, um, we, uh, this curriculum was created um, in a, a collaboration with uh, our team at the city and then also Beta NYC who is uh, the, uh, the folks who put on this amazing conference today. Um, so we have, I, sh I should have the number of open data ambassadors like off the top of my head, but we're, I think we're in, the, we're in the many dozens of open data ambassadors now that have been trained in this curriculum. Um, so, uh, and also give feedback at the end about the curriculum itself. Um, that would be lovely. Okay, brief history of NYC open data. So that, 
the only data law was passed in 2012. Um, Noel talked a little bit about this as well, that sponsor big deal brewer. Uh, and the point of the open data law is that basically like you're the government is the government, you own the government, right? Like <laughs> the, the, the government operates on behalf of the citizens of New York. The government picks up the trash. The government runs the school system. The government is, you know, all of the things the government does, they're doing it on behalf of New Yorkers. And you should know, you should know, and you should own that data. It's data about New York. It's data about New Yorkers. It's generated in the service of New Yorkers. That information should be open and publicly accessible, both for, you know, just on principle and also so that citizens can use that data to look at what the government is doing, to inspect how things are going, to learn stuff. And you know, if you think about the city of New York, you know, it's it's an, it's it's actually like kind of hard to wrap your head around all of the data that it was in New York and all of the things that could be represented as data in New York. And again, I think it's important to remember that data, you know, data is an attempt to sort of capture reality, if you like to record it, but it's not, it's never really, you know, you're never going to be able to create what New York is in data. But we can say, you know, here are all the licensed taxi cabs in the city. And, he, you know, here's the people, here are the people that have to pass the licensing exam to be a TLC, a taxi limousine commission driver. You know, here, here are where all the public trash bins are for like, does it capture the experience of like the smell of a public trash bin in the middle of the Absolutely not. But we can know where they are. Um, you know, here's, here's where all the banks are. Here's where all of the... And, you know, here's the direction of each of these streets. Here's all the one-way streets that go east. Here's all the one-way streets that go west. Again, does that, like, capture the feeling of, like, oh, my gosh, I'm, like, lost in the the West Village and there's two uh, Greenwich streets and I can't figure out which one I'm supposed to be on? One time I was supposed to go to a party in college. I'm so old that I lived in New York before there were, like, smartphones. And so I was supposed to go to a party on Greenwich, I think on Greenwich Street, and I found Venice, but I like had looked up the directions in advance to Greenwich Avenue. And so I just like walked around the village for like an hour and like never found the party. And it was like, oh, like that living target doesn't look like half in New York anymore, which is crazy. Um, but anyway, <laughs> this is, you know, we think about data sometimes as like a, tw- as, and the thing that's new or like, this is, this is, this is a 21st century thing, but like data is actually, you know, data has been around in the city for a very long time. Um, and, uh, you know, the, if you go back to kind of like the progressive movement in New York City, um, uh, you know, this, the, and, and Tammany Hall, it's sort of all of the, the uh, reformist efforts to, to make government more, you know, technocratic and less sort of, um, you know, guys in a, two guys in a room with, I don't know, I don't know what the guys in the room did. Um, I would definitely not have been a that room. So, um, uh, this is, uh, the pro- these progressive reforms, you know, one of the things that those progressive reforms created was the city record. How many, of you, how many people have ever looked at the city record before or know what the city record is? I mean, yeah, only a few, only a few hands. That's great. Um, it started publication in 1873, um, both in print, um, the, the, back in 1873 in print. Now it's also online. Um, and the, the point was, it's, you know, this is an early transparency effort, basically, in, in city government history um, in the wake of the, you know, Boss Tweed era. Um, and uh, it had, it has uh, information about city solicitations, public notices, purchases, and hiring. And you actually, you can see all of the old scans of the city of Rockford, um at uh, the NYU what is the problem? Sorry, NYU City Record Project has a has like the actual scans of all the old records. It's fun to check it out and also kind of like see how much it's changed or not changed. Just the interesting thing, like a lot of the a lot of the things that um, you know, a lot of these like even even some of kind of like the old tiny language has persisted in the city record um, to this day. Um, but you can see that you know this is this is sort of it's very it's very textual. It's very it's it's not data in sort of a tabular fashion the way we think of data today, but it is it is information that is being conveyed to citizens via official government records. Um, and then in the 1960s, 1970s, so we see the advent of the of, of the Freedom of Information Law um, um, movement. So freedom of uh, people frequently abbreviate this as FOIL. So if you see that or FOIA, 
Um, if it's an after a law, the Freedom of Information Act or Freedom of Information Law. So if you see that acronym around, that's that's what it is. Um, and this basically gives citizens the power to to request official government documents. Um, and the 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 um, one interesting way that FOIL interacts with the New York City Open Data Law is that any information that is FOILed from a city agency is then supposed to be released on open the open data platform. So one of the things, or sorry, data, I should say, that's spoiled from, if you like to spoil everyone's emails, we're not, we're not publishing those emails on the open data site, but if you ask for data from a city agency, you know, one of our, one of the things that my team does in, in sort of what we call the compliance cycle each year, we go from every, to every agency, to every open data coordinator across the city and say, hey, did anybody ask for any data from any data for you? Did you release any data from FOIL this year? We want to make sure that then that's on the open data portal. Um, this is actually, this is the, uh, this is the response to a FOIL asking for the Martin Luther King task force uh data or information to the fbi um and you can see and one of the things i love about this is like um like all of the ways that offices have changed to pretend like all of these people like signed up on this and they all like affixed their signature to the to the uh you know this this like memorandum is that would be about this equal 1977. i really do appreciate typewriters um, <laughs> okay and then that brings us you know up to the 90s um so in a couple of you know, couple of decades later, New York City released its first public data directory. Um, and again, this is sort of, um, there's uh, this application, uh, this this listing up the side for the agency is Department of Buildings. The application name is BIS, which is, stands for business, uh, uh, business Information Services, maybe? Or I'm building information. Building information is for fake you. <laughs> yes. Uh, and h hilariously, Viz is like still in use to this day. They, they've been migrating some of the applications and services onto a new fiber, but some Viz is like an old mainframe system from the city that is like still around to this day. So it really helps you appreciate kind of the like way that uh, data systems are sometimes slow to evolve, um, both in both in the government and I think in like big corporations as well. So. Um, this uh this public data directory was released um in 1993 um and uh you know the the contrast here is like you know it's for you kind of have to know what you're asking for you have to you have to write a specific request like i would like to see all of the emails sent from this person to this person on the following day or i would like all of i would like a summary of all of the you know the, the demographic breakdown of who this program served from this period to that period you know, with the following categories, you have to, you have to say what you're looking for, but open with open data and sort of this move towards making data accessible, you don't have to know in advance what you're looking for. The idea is the records are there. You can go in and investigate. You can go in and ask the questions that you're interested in asking, and the data should be there to, to support it. And if it's not there, you can, you can ask for a data set. And that's what we'll talk about too. So what can you do with open data? Um, if you're looking for something that doesn't exist. Um, right, so now we're in 2012, um, we've passed the city, but New York City's open data law has passed. Um, a lot of cities have open data laws now, um, but we think New York's is kind of the, is the coolest and best, obviously, because we're New York and we always think we're the best. Um, uh, this, you know, this, a lot of cities have open data as sort of like a, an executive order or, um, a policy, but we have a lot. So this is, you know, now, now it's a 10 year old law. This is actually like a pretty established program in the world of, you know, governments and, and, uh, um, and it's continually been amended and improved over time as well. So, you know, the uh, open data law is a living document. If you have ideas for ways that the law should be changed, you can go to your city council members, like the city council members that are here today, talk to them about it. The law continues to change and grow as this program evolves evolves um and if you haven't um if you've never checked out the city's administrative code that's also a great banger of a read <laughs> um uh, i don't recommend reading it late at night when you're well maybe you do recommend reading it late at night when you're trying to fall asleep um but uh you can read can actually you can read all of the rules and are laid out for the open data program um uh in the city's administrative code so and also like learn all sorts of other amazing things um there as well okay 
So just to like toot our own horn for a little bit, we have over 1 million visitors each year to the Open Data Portal. We have more than 3,000 data sets. And actually, one of the things I'm kind of like, we're thinking a lot about is like, you know, quantity is not the only game in town, right? Like the volume of data that we're releasing is obviously important, but also the quality of that data is very important. So um, thinking about sort of ways to capture that experience as well for, um, you know, so when we talk about open data, we're also not just being like, oh, there's more data than ever, because sometimes that's not actually better. Um, uh, and it's made possible by a network of approximately 100 open data coordinators across city agencies and offices, um, and commissions, boards, every, but every sort of structure in government that you can think of basically has an open data coordinator that we work with. Um, and we love them and they're wonderful. And a lot of them are here today. So do, um, do say hi. Okay. Let's see. We're going to walk through a couple, um, so now we're, okay, we're going to look at sort of like history, like big picture stuff. Anybody have any questions about any of that before we dive into actually looking at open data, the open data portal and looking at, uh, particular data sets themselves. All right. Think of a question later, holler. I will be there. Adam. Okay. So here we are on the, oops, sorry to do it Oh yeah. Here we are on the New York City Open Data website. So, um, I'm going to maybe actually just do, I'm going to pull up the open data website on here as well. So you can just Google open data NYC, but the data, the site is nyc.gov slash open data or open data dot city of New York dot US. Um, I 99% of the time just Google things and, uh, it's actually pretty well, pretty well optimized for finding things via Google. Um, so this is a New York city open data website and the, uh, um, on the front door, you know, we've got uh, the, the front, the front door here, we've got a couple of options of ways to find data. So, um, there is a like very easy sort of keyword search here too. So if we're looking, um, you know, we're looking for 311 data, we could just type in 311 here and it will, you know, search and return the data sets, um, related to 311. Um, you can also go to this data, um, this data uh, listing up here, I guess, on this, on this menu. And that will bring you to kind of a more like browse through it experience. So you can look for particular agencies. You can look for, um, you can look in sort of like policy domains here, you know, business, education, environment, health. Um, you can look, I like the most popular data sets. It's like kind of a fun way to, to take a look and see what people are looking at. Um, DLB job application file names, very, uh, very top of mind, the civil service list, um, the taxi limousine commis commissions, new driver application status. <laughs> um, I think a lot of, a lot of folks that are hoping to become a taxi, uh, taxi limousine, which are a driver, uh, like have to look at this to see if they've been approved. So it's a data set that can actually get looked at pretty frequently, uh, as well as the civil service list. If you're taking a test to become a city employee, this is, um, uh, and then we also see the 311 service requests on data set, which is actually the data set we're going to spend a good amount of time chatting about today. Um, and we're going to look at this specific data set for a couple of reasons. One, it's like, I think hopefully 311 folks are familiar with 311, but 311 is the city's sort of front door for information, for service requests. Um, 311 actually just turned 20 this year, which is awesome. Um, and they released a set, they released a really funny set of the, um, the, like the best 311 calls over the last 20 years, including like, there's a raccoon eating um, lasagna on my porch. Like, what do I do? <laughs> like other, or like, I think my apartment is haunted. Or can you tell me if my boyfriend is still married? There were some really great, um, <laughs> really great examples. So definitely, uh, which are in his data set. So we can go looking for raccoons eating lasagna. Um, at some point, which is maybe not the highest uh, and best use of my time to teach you how to do stuff right now, but um, is fun. Um, so uh, yeah, so three one one, you can call three one one, you can text three one one. There's a three one one application that you can download onto your smartphone. So I think a lot of folks think of three one one as like obviously because it's a phone number, but actually, actually, a increasingly large share of three one one is conducted via online, via the website, via the app via texting. So it's not just calls, it's a, a whole different ways of, of contacting the government here. Okay. 
So let's get to know 311 a little bit. Um, oh, other fun facts about 311. It is 24-7, uh, 365. There is never a time that 311 is not available. Um, it has uh, information and, and you can interact with 311 in over, in over 175 languages. Um, so anyone, you know, whatever, uh, whatever uh, language you would like to inter interact with 311 in, uh, and it covers about 3,600 government services that 311 can kind of hook you up with um, if you call 311. Um, you can also um, tweet at 311. That is a very fun, uh, very fun activity. Um, okay, so here we are on the 311 um, data site and the, the 311 data set. Um, and the one we're looking at right here is the 311 service requests from 2010 to present. So as I said, you know, you can call 311 and just ask for information. Like a lot of people call 311 and be like, is alternate side parking on today? And that's recorded, but it's not recorded in this data set. This data set is, there's a, we, I think you, you probably saw it as we were looking through, there's like call center inquiry data set. And that's for people that are just calling for information. The service request data set is people that are calling to um, ask for something to be fixed or yeah, um, in, in, I don't want to call them complaints per se, but like you're calling to complain about something. So let's say, um, that, uh, they want to, there is a pothole on the street. There's a, um, a car that's illegally parked, um, on their block that hasn't been towed and, or there's, um, uh, the heat and hot water in my apartment building is out. It's like, it's calls asking for the government to do something and to respond in some way. So this is the data set we're going to take a look at. Um, and we're going to look a little bit about sort of like orient, uh, orient ourselves to this, uh, to this page. Um, there's some very important information, um, uh, that we want to take a look at before we actually kind of dive into the data. And this is a step that I think frequently gets skipped. People are like, take me straight to the data. I don't care about the rest of this information. Like, just get me in. I just want to start like coding and like doing cool stuff and like digging into things. But it's actually just the information that you can get about a data set from this stage is very, very important. Um, and some things definitely to uh, was bring your attention to. We have the date that this data set was last updated. This is always a good thing to keep an eye on. Um, open data has data sets that are both actively maintained, but like new records are being created every day. But it also has some data sets that are historical in nature. So this is a data set that captured sort of information about a program and maybe that program isn't, um, isn't running any longer. Or this is all the data about school attendance for the year. 2017. Um, we're working on making that better for <laughs> some uh, school data and more uh, uh, together. But um, it's always important to kind of take a look at when it was updated. Um, and we actually be happy only to see when the data was last updated and also when the metadata was last updated. Who knows what metadata is? Okay, great. Some uh, metadata is data about data, <laughs> which is kind of, I, which is not. So there you go. And and uh, uh, every every data set has information associated with it with that data set, and that's that's what metadata is. So it's kind of like a fancy sounding word, but it's just the information about the data set. Um, we know that uh, this page will tell us the agency that that creates this data or maintains this data, the update frequency. So how how often can you expect this data set to update? Sometimes things update daily. Sometimes things update quarterly. Sometimes things update yearly. And it will tell you what to expect there. And, and it will tell you whether or not the data set is automatically updated. So some data sets we have sort of, you know, full and like robots are doing it all for us. And we don't have, no human has to sort of like push a button to, to update stuff. And um, some data sets are more manually updated. Um, so this is important, uh, important information. We can see how many times this data set has been viewed, the number of downloads of this data set. Um, and if I, if you look at nothing else, I think the two things that I would like you to, uh, to, uh, understand this section here that says what's in this data set, this is very important. It tells you how many rows are in a data set, how many columns are in the data set and what each row represents, which is really the most important thing. And this is something that sometimes can like steer people wrong. Um, you know, this each, each row is a 311 service request. Each row is not a 311 call. 
So this is, an, this is a distinction, and this is something that's important to understand when you're interacting with the data set. Like, what does that data actually represent? Did you have a question or? Yeah. yeah. No, please. Yes, I'm just curious. Is this uh, some sort of collection, data collection template for the people that are inputting the data? What's the, yeah, in terms of the data getting into the spreadsheet is one thing, but I mean, people are calling in. How cool? What's the template that the three woman operated to using with the data? Yeah, so there is a template for them. Um, they have they have a they get they have a system. So all of the three one one call takers and all of the three one one and both call takers and the folks that are responding to requests from the web and all of that kind of stuff. And um, they have a they have yeah like a sort of like an online form basically that they're entering information into. I'm not sure that the online form is available. I mean, it's, it, it basically reflects what you would see when you're entering a 311 service request on the web. You know, that's the information that the the person who's receiving that request gets. Um, but then they have the ability to sort of, you know, add additional information. And we'll look at that actually, because that additional information is reflected in the data set. Like, when did they look at it? Who did they forward it to? Who's going to respond to it? How long did it take that person to respond to the request? So that information continue continues to be updated about that record you know after over time um so yeah and actually a great way to find out some of that information is also to check out the data dictionary for the data set and the data dictionary i'm not going to probably close i can see if we can download it here actually um a data dictionary is a guide to a data set that um uh that Let's you know, sort of for each of these, um, you know, we start with kind of basic data, data information. This very much looks like the data or the metadata that was on the, um, uh, data set page, but with some additional information, like how is this data collected? Um, so to your question, you know, how is this coming in? Um, what types, how can I use this data? What types of questions are good to answer with this data? Um, what are some unique characteristics or limitations of this data set. Again, always a good idea to ask yourself, like, is this data set actually going to be able to answer the question that I'm trying to answer? Um, uh, and then we also have the uh, information about every single column. So, um, you know, stepping back, like what, what we have open right here now is a, um, is a spreadsheet and a spreadsheet is information that's organized into rows and columns and uh the columns are each sort of an attribute about a about a particular thing so you can think of like um in spotify or in your itunes library right you've got a song a and the song would be a row and the columns would be like who is the artist what is the album that that song is from when was it recorded? Who was the producer? Like there's attributes about that piece of information. Um, and you could, that, that's the same for like, you know, the library card catalog. Each row is a book. Each column is a piece of information about that book. When was it published? Who is the author? When was it last checked out? Um, there's this information that is, it's a way, it's like a structural way of organizing information. You could also think of that as like, you know, you could also just write it all down as a memo, right? Or like you could write it out in text. But spreadsheets give you the opportunity to structure that information in a way that promotes easier inquiry of it after the fact. Um, so this data dictionary is a structured set of information about the data. And it tells you for each of these column and columns, the name of the column, a description of the column, what the expected or allowed values are. So what, what are you going to see when you're looking in that column? Like, it's going to be a date, and that date is going to be in the following format. Um, some limitations about the data, about that, 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 about that particular column, you know. In some cases, the skill will spell out an acronym, but in others, it will indicate a specific office within an agency or repeat the acronym. Like, you, you probably find that out as you're interacting with the data, but it's nice to know in advance going into it what you're going to find. Uh, and then any additional notes that we have about that particular column. So, yeah. Definitely check out and check out the um, check out the uh, data dictionary for every data set that you're taking a look at. Um, okay. I have a question. Yeah. Is that is this data dictionary? Two questions. Yeah. Is the data dictionary to be breaked across all the guests? Okay. 
And then what classify uh, the, the functions or the ethnic history shown us already is that to also be expected across yeah, was this okay. Yeah. And then what classifies and you may get to this it, so feel free to let me know what what classifies as outdated data? It depends on the data set. I imagine. Yeah. So, so how you what are the some of the parameters? Exactly. Yeah. So one of the that that update frequency that I that I mentioned, that's kind of how you should assess whether or not a data set is is up to date or not. So if it's updated yearly and the last time it was updated was in, you know, April of 2022 and it's now April of 2023, you should be expecting that data to be updated, you know, a year from when it was last updated. If it's updated daily and the last time it was updated, then, you know, a day ago, then you should expect it to be updated today again. Uh, and if, and if you ever, and we'll, I'll show you where this is on the homepage as well. Um, but if you ever have a question or you're like, I think this should have updated, but it hasn't updated. We have a help desk that is staffed and uh, to respond to inquiries about data sets and really any inquiry doesn't have to be like, Hey, I don't, I think this didn't get updated. It could, it could also be like, can you help, can you help me understand this? Or like, I need to talk to the person who created this or whatever. Like we, we take those inquiries and we answer them, um, like humans, humans answer them. Chat GPT is not involved in anything about the open data program for like, it's not at all question. Yeah, yeah, like for instance, you mentioned education data. Yeah, like you get back to the after school information and it was like 2000 clarity. So that be classified and outdated or? If it said that it would be updated that year, then yes, it would be outdated. If it says that it's a historic data set and we're not expecting it to update again, then it is what it is. And that was the data about the year 2017. And there should be either a new data set, maybe they've changed the format or something, or it's moved, and, you know, in some cases, after school program, like move, move between the agency for responsible for them, but the girls just like in some days all suffer on that. But like, um, yeah, if you, that update frequency is how you can tell whether or not you should ever expect a data set to be updated. Um, and there, there's a category of update frequency that says historic, which basically means you should not expect that this data will be updated again. Um, but if you have a question about it, if you're like, I think this data should be updated again, or I want to find out, like, is this, why is this not being updated? Call us and we will help you figure that out. Okay, is that your story? Yep. So has ever um, a data set have there ever been changed categories or agencies? We are, uh, it's going to impact now with this, it's going to be categorized as update or historic. So how would the person, the viewer know? So when you go to this page, how would it indicate that that particular data, data set has been categorized? Yeah. Uh, That's a, good a, a different agency, because it's also aging driven, agency driven. Yeah, it's still saying to me. I'm just trying to figure out yeah. different layers. Yeah, and I don't want to kind of lead you down the garden path of what are pretty layers <laughs> situations, but um, the there's two things to look for one is um on the let me go back to this data set here so on the data and then you think of a good example so and there's um there's some notes on the top right here so frequently when there's a data set that is that is like going away for some reason or not going away but like is is getting hit, made historic um and isn't going to be updated in the future or is like this program so um i'm trying to think of a good example but like um, or like during the pandemic, right? There were some programs that were run during the pandemic that are not going to necessarily continue past the pandemic period, which again, like what is the past of the pandemic period? I don't know, but, um, we're all kind of figuring that out. But like, uh, uh, there was, there was a program during the pandemic to deliver, um, to deliver air conditioners to senior citizens. Um, and it ran it ran in a different way during the pandemic than it runs in its regular in its regular course of business, I guess. So there will be a a there will be there's a data set about that period of time when it was be when that program was being delivered under the pandemic, like in the pandemic way. And then there's another data set that's like this program getting delivered in its regular way. But this is pretty rare. Like you should hopefully like for for the for the data sets that I think are most valuable and most used, Alan, it's very, it's, it's, um, it's, that's, that's kind of like a real edge case. So I'm actually going to kind of like move on to it and, um, uh, move on to take a look at this data set, but we can talk more after these are good questions. And there's like, 
a lot of governance around how to how to interpret and like how how we make those decisions about when to make a data set historic versus when it keeps updated, et cetera. So whew, good questions. You guys are keeping me on my toes. Um, okay. So um, let's take a look here at the 311 data set. So we're back on this 311 data set homepage. Um, and one thing to take a look at, uh, this data set has 32.5 million rows. Does anyone know what the, the limit of Microsoft Excel is for opening up a data set? Best. Way less than 32.5 million. It is 1 million. <laughs> you can open a 1 million row data set in Excel. Um, and even and Excel will not be happy about it. So like it, it might do it, but like it will it'll be really grumpy. Um, and this is you know every service request since 2010. Um, we to to interact with this data, um, we're gonna need to filter it down. So to do that, we're gonna we're gonna go to this button right here that says View Data, and it's gonna take us to our data set. And you can tell that it's taking a little while to load because this is such a big data set. Um, and hopefully it will do it. Um, otherwise, it's gonna be a really short. Low it. Another short presentation. Um, the what? Oh yeah. Go ahead. No, the code that said I can wait till later. Okay, I was just gonna say the the company that hosts this platform and that does a lot of open data portals, both local, state government, federal government, um, uh, is called Socrata. Um, so you'll see you'll see stuff that looks like this on lots of other open data portals as well. So if you interact with like the New York State. Open data portal looks like this. Um, some of the like uh, like data.gov is also a Socrata um, uh, product. So uh, if you if you learn it here, you can apply this to lots of other open data um, sources across the web. Um, and they actually recently updated this this user interface, and I think it's a lot it's a lot cleaner and nicer. Um, but you can go back to the old view if you are used to interacting it with the old in the old way. Um, uh, by just clicking on the switch to grid view um, here. So now I've got every single every single service request and you can see sort of, you know, this looks like a spreadsheet. We've got rows, each of these rows is a service request. Each of these columns tells us something about the service request. And let's say that I would like to filter this, this data down to several service requests that have happened in the last five days in my community district. Um, so what I'm going to do is base, is use this um, use this functionality called filter, <laughs> um, and it's asking what it's asking for me to do is tell it what I'm what I'm looking for. So tell it sort of the like logic, um, and so uh, um, um, of that sentence that I just said, right? Like show me all of the service requests that were created in the last five days that were filed in my community district. So if you can say that sentence, you can build the filter. Um, so that's something that's kind of, like kind of, it's an easy way to kind of think of this is like, say out loud what I'm looking for and then go to the filters um, and, and use the filters to recreate that sentence. So here's my last five days. So I'd like it to be, um, let's say, uh, I'm gonna do this between, but you can, there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, oh, this is, let me see if I can make this a little bigger. Here we go, yeah, okay. So one, two, three, four, five. So since the 13th, and it's it's actually timestamped. So let me say that it's, you know, since 9 a.m. on the 13th and now, essentially. And then I have this, this, uh, this option to add additional filters. So I'm going to add, but I could also, um, or I'm going to add an and statement. So again, going back to that sentence, I would like all of the service requests that have been found in the last five days and are in my community district. I could also say or, right? I could say I would like all of the service requests that were filed in the last five days or that happened in the last 24 hours or right or, or, or happened three weeks ago, right? Like you can, you, and that's sort of like, if you think of like Venn diagrams, right? You've seen those um, on in news articles or things like that. That's kind of that idea that like either you can take everything in the bucket that fits both of those descriptions, or you can take everything in this bucket and everything in this bucket. Um, uh, and those are the, they're called logical operators for those of you who are into that um, type of stuff. Okay, and then I would like the community district, community board 
two is is let's see how this is Reflector. oh no come on Is Colin maybe? There we go. Oh, yep. Hold on. All right, use text. Maybe community. Actually, let's do the zip code. That might be easier. Um, this is my zip code. Okay. And now you can see up here that right now it's like the full 35 million rows. But if I apply this filter. This should go down considerably, right? Like, what would we expect? What would we expect here? I don't know. Do we want to just guess while it's running how many service requests have been filed the last five days from one one two oh one? Oh, per moment. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> That's out of thousand. Yeah, no. Also, my zip code didn't really work. Hold on. Okay. Here's a great example, right? Like, look at all these zip codes that are not New York City zip codes. Where? Uh, I don't know. Uh, see, now I messed this up because the filter did not apply the zip code correctly. Hold on. All right. Oh, no. Oh, success. Not success. Try again. Okay. And incident zip is 11201. What's that? The badge. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is the problem with live, live demos, guys. You get to see all the words. Okay. Um, well, that's... Yep, not that. Uh, all right, we're gonna we're gonna skip this zip code for now. I don't know why it's not property, but we're just gonna filter down to the yesterday because I think that will give us enough data to be able to work with without um, having to uh, having to uh, wait for that to figure out itself out. How many listed aids? Yeah, there is. Um, it depends. So um, I think if if the if the if the column the information stored in the column is numeric. It's equal to if it's text, it is. Right. So yeah. one one two oh five. One one two oh one would be Um yes, but if you noticed in that um it actually tells you so this little this little icon right here tells you the type of data that's in that column. And for zip it actually is it's stored as text because there are values in that zip code column. Like you saw when we when we were seeing some of the previews, right? That there was one that was like LE seven, which is probably somebody visiting from London who gave us their like home zip code in London instead of their the zip code of where they the incident occurred. So it's a it's you are right. In an ideal world, those would only be numeric zips, but instead that column is text because sometimes we get values in there that are not Strictly five-digit alphanumeric values. Uh, oh man. Well, it's clear it's taking a while because there's a lot of data. Um, but uh, hopefully this will work uh, out, Charlie. Usually, when I do this, when I do these um, on Zoom, where I like pre-do everything, um, but since we're on this lovely CUNY law school computer. I didn't have to use stupid because we got all in here up late, but um, let's, we'll give it a second to see if it uh, works. Yeah. Error. Oh no, error. Oh my God. Error. That's terrible. Okay. All right. This is, you guys feel free to tweet about how terrible is this uh, live demo. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, let's do that. Let's do the 15th. Uh, let's do that. Last, last, last Friday. Nine, nine to new last Friday. Oops. Okay. So I switched to the old. Oh, no, no, go back. Um, create a date. Last Friday. 9 a.m. 
the two last Friday. Back to you. All right. Don't, don't, don't do me dirty here if you're out of line. There we go. Okay. Excellent. All right. That worked. So you see how many raid we have now? I'll move my cursor out of the way. We went from 32 million to 3,890. 3,890 is a much easier data set to work with than 32 million rows. Um, and now I can do some stuff with this data. I can export this data. So I can take basically take this data out of the 311 data for uh, uh, out of the open data portal and save it as a spreadsheet. Um, so a download file, so CSV or a um, CSV stands for comma separated values. It's basically just a way of, of like saving and organizing the spreadsheet and CSVs you can open in Excel. Um, if you are a person who codes, this data is also available as an API endpoint. So either in JSON or CSV, and it will give you the endpoint um, string to copy um, and use. You can use this with pandas. If you, you, know, you can just open by URL with pandas or um, if you use R, whatever, um, whatever sort of um, coding language you prefer, you have that option. So I'm going to download this data set. And what if I open this data set in Excel? I'm going to see this. This is the data set that I just created on the open data site. Um, and it should be 3,000, yeah, 3,890 rows. There's one row that's the column name. So this is 3,890 rows of data that matches what I was expecting here. And I can now interact with this data however I want in Excel. But you can also interact with this data. Um, you can also do visualizations and stuff. Um, with the, um, on the open data site itself. Um, but actually let me show you one more thing here. So i am now got this long list of all of the SRs that were, or sorry, service requests, which we SR for short, um, all of the service requests that were created on the 3rd of March. And let's say I'm interested in like how many of them were created for each agency. So what I can do is I can group this data. So underneath this sort of like filter icon, there's a, there's an icon to group data. And let's say I'd like to group it up by agency. So I'm going to do agency, this short agency, just to kind of make it a little easier. Um, and then I have an option for how to aggregate it. So what I'm, the sentence that I'm making here is, I, is basically like, I have all of the, I'd like to see every service request that was created on March 3rd. And I would like to see how many service requests were created and assigned to each agency on that date. So if that how many means that I'm counting. So when I'm at, when it's asking sort of how to aggregate, I'm going to say, I'm going to count the number of service requests. There's a lot of other options here, um, but the ones that you're probably most, most, op uh, most frequently going to use are count or sum. So if you have data that's, that's numeric, that's like, uh, you know, um, just a quick primer on data types, right? Like there's, there's numbers, which are things that you can add together. And then there's text, um, which are things that you wouldn't, even if it is a number, it's something you wouldn't add it together, right? Like a phone number is a number, but you would never add two phone numbers together. So that means that that data is, is text data basically, and not, and not numeric data. Same with zip codes, right? Like it doesn't make any sense to add zip codes together, but, um, the, uh, I'll uh, so whenever we're, whenever we're sort of looking at data that is text, generally what you, what you're doing is counting something. Um, so I'm going to count this data by, um, by agency. And here we go. We can see that on March 3rd, 941 of the service requests that were created on that date were, um, service requests that went to HPD, which is housing preservation and development. That's the city agency that's responsible for um uh, uh this uh the city's housing stop they are the agency that takes requests about heat and hot water complaints which is one of the most frequent type of 311 service request um so we all we frequently see them kind of at the top you know being an agency that gets a lot of um requests and i can actually sort this i can sort by the the most frequent um service requests count type here so you can see that the NYPD got 1,133 service requests on March 3rd between 9 and 5 p.m. Um, HPD got 941. DOT, the Department of Transportation, that's where service requests about potholes or street repairs or 
Um, Street signs go to 466 requests. ESNY, which is the sanitation department, 453, um, and on down the road. And actually, our agency, um, the Office of Technology and Innovation, got one service request <laughs> on March 3rd. We should go look it up for one of it. Um, we might be about a link NYC kiosk. That's one of the things that uh, our agency is responsible for. So um, that would be my guess on one of it. But maybe it's not enough data. Who knows? Uh, we can find out. You know, data is great. Why guess when you can know? That is the that is the the um the thing about data. Okay, I am like way behind. We also started a little late, so I'm going to um just quickly take a look, go back to this data set here and show you how you can make visualizations um as well. So I can also I can export this, I can export that little analysis that I did just to CSV and take it into Excel and do stuff with it. You can also visualize data um on uh, on the open data portal itself. So if I go back here and say create visualization, um, I'm not going to save it right now, but you can um, you can sign in and 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 uh, and save your own visualizations. I'm again going to filter this down because 32 million rows is too much for uh, this to work um, quickly. So I'm going to say that I am looking for. Let's see, 2023, March 3rd, and oops, I'm three, I don't actually know why the filters are different on the visualization page than they are on the, um, uh, on the, uh, other page, because now we have, we have 15,000 uh rows here because we um are including both uh we're including a bigger time frame basically anyway something to talk to Socrata about i will be talking to them there and we can select either data or a chart type to get started so let's make a um let's say we're gonna make a pie chart um i know pie charts get a bad rap but sometimes they're fun um and we're gonna do agency and we're gonna do again count of the rows here um and i would only like to see the top five agencies and i would like to group everything else as other so here we go we've got this handy little visualization now of the top five agencies that got uh, that had the most 311 service requests filed on this uh from the third to the fourth of this year and we can see that um the the, all the rest of the agencies, apart from this top five, uh, represent 16% of the service requests that were filed that day. Um, I can change the chart type up here. Maybe I'd like to see a bar chart instead. Again, up the top five bars here, you can change uh, you can change these settings over here on the left. See a column chart. Um, and one cool thing that you can do also is make a map um, right directly from this data. Um, I'm going to actually, let me filter this down a little even further because um, the map stuff, you really want a particular um, geography and pens will help make it a little, let's try this zip again, see if it does me, dir does me dirty. Okay, here we go. Apply. Okay, so now my, my data has changed and I'm going to switch to a map and I'm going to tell it that the, I'm going to, we're going to give it a second to see if it'll do it. Um, basically, any New York City open data sets are supposed to have geography attached to them. They're supposed to be geocoded. It's actually one of the amendments to the open data law. Um, we are still making sure that all of the data is geocoded that can be geocoded. Um, so if you see a data set that has an address on it but doesn't include a geocode, like a latitude and longitude, um, those of you who go, you know, going back to kind of like, uh, you know, geography class in school, right? Every point on the globe has a latitude and longitude. Um, and more complicated than that, but we should have we should have that information available. And if you find a data set that isn't geocoded but should be, please let us know. And um, I'll show you what the how to use the Open Data Help Desk here in a second. Yeah, question. Yeah, the question was going to be about that. So for example, yeah. it doesn't have the address, but it had the geocode. Does that isn't that still then disclosing like? I'm just wondering if there's certain information where you don't want the address of like the person making a complaint. If it has the geocode, isn't that scoped in disclosing the address? Right. 
It depends is the, is the answer. So, um, like in the 311, that of request, if yeah. it can happen, it doesn't have the, at least what I thought loosely just now, yep. it doesn't have the address, but it does have the longitude latitude of the right there. It, it has for, for information that is, we don't, we don't use the unit, like a latitude and longitude doesn't have a unit. So it's, it's a little bit of a fine line, right? Like in some, in some places, obviously in a single family home, if we have the latitude and longitude, we could probably figure out that it's your house. It's also interesting in the 311 data set, the data, that, ge that geography data is about the incident and not the caller. So it's not the home address of the person who's calling. It is the place where the service request needs to be done. Um, there are particular uh, calls for information to 311 where we actually don't release information about it because like if you're calling for domestic violence resources or you're calling you know, for sort of sensitive information, we have to, we don't include that in the data on purpose. Um, and you can, you know, there's information about the types of service requests or the types of calls for information that we don't actually provide information on. These are, these are, these are like hairy questions for sure, right? Like how do we balance sort of transparency and, and openness with not compromising individuals personally identified information without compromising, um, without compromising people's um, you know, ability to feel confident that they can call the government and ask for help. Um, anyway, this map is not loading, so this is a bummer of an end time, but I'm going to just quickly show you the open data and help desk here to find that. Um, and then I, we, we have like 100% run out of time, which is classic Martha. I've talked too long. Um, but you can contact us. And you'll see a bunch of different information here, sort of like our little facts here. But at the bottom, we've got a send us a note. And I know we all hate government web forms. It feels like you're talking to the void. But literally, you're talking to me and Alex. Actually, Alex, uh, raise your hand. Um, <laughs> me and Alex and Zachary and Ariana and Kay and the open data team, we are the ones who are looking at these submissions and, and answering them. So you're, and we're not a void, we promise. Um, and we do respond to, uh, to ask for assistance. And we have a bunch of different ways, you know, we have some we're collecting data as well you know it's like you can help us help us help you by telling us a little bit about what you're looking for um but we love open data users and we're so excited to help you out and i hope you're leaving this session today feeling a little bit more empowered to interact with the open data portal um to ask questions to uh to go check out the data that's available i'm sorry we ran out of time but i'll be around here um uh, come say hi and uh, uh, thank you all so much for being here today. And uh, I'll I'll stick around for questions if folks have them in the in the interval. Um, but yes, thank you. And thank you.